Earlier this week, the news came that Forbes magazine has crowned two new people as the world's richest man and richest woman. What you might not know is that they are both French. Bernard Arnault, the head of Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy, has a personal fortune of some 200 billion euros. And Francoise Betancourt Myers, the granddaughter of the founder of L'Oreal, is worth a mere 73 billion euros. Gender disparity rises again. Sharing a neighborhood as we do with Louis Vuitton, perhaps exactly nothing about that is surprising to you. I'm always struck by the line of people standing outside the door of the flagship Louis Vuitton store down here on the corner, just waiting for their turn to be parted from their money by the solicitations of a personal sales assistant who, I am told, never leaves them unaccompanied. What I want you to take note of in that little news item is this simple fact. The wealthiest man and the wealthiest woman in the world got that way by being associated with businesses that sell utterly unnecessary things. They do not build anything. They do not manufacture appliances or things that we need. They do not improve public health or promote the general welfare. They make luxuries and jewelry and cosmetics and spectacularly expensive versions of a very basic necessity clothes. They own brands, ways that we imagine we can shape our identity or signal our worth to the world, and just maybe ourselves as well. It is a fair question just why it is in a world so spiritually adrift as ours that a in a society that has so relentlessly eradicated all of the places for mystery and enchantment in our culture, all of the places where the sacred can touch down, why in that culture the places where the people worship are the temples of luxury? But I suppose the answer lies in the question. This is how our culture makes its meaning, trading the mystery of the spirit for a measured, cynical hope. My learned young colleague, Canon Ullery, put his finger on the root of it in his sermon last night. We have lost our sense of the power and mercy of God's love suffusing our whole existence. And what has rushed in to fill the void, whether we admit it or not, is not doubt, but fear. We fear our lives will be without meaning, and so we try to purchase meaning by sacrificing our resources for artificially scarce luxuries. We fear our bodies will grow old, and so we try to purchase youth in jars and bottles. We fear the tragedy and sorrow and meaninglessness of this world, the loss of the wonder we knew as children, and so we deaden our senses by buying the wide offerings of intoxicants and attitude adjustments. And into that world, that world trying to buy and sell material meaning and rigorously denying the possibility of the spiritual, into that world comes the outrageous scandal of the cross. 
into that world that values only luxury and ease and fame and wealth comes the audacious and insane claim that a helpless man crying out from an instrument of suffering and execution creates the very ground of meaning, meaning that can neither be overcome or dismissed. Into the brutality of this world, in the most unlovely of ways, love itself, self-giving, self-emptying love, love wholly for others, is revealed as the true nature of God and of all made in God's image. The cross is not and cannot be loved. Yet only the crucified Christ can bring the freedom which changes the world because it is no longer afraid of death. Those are the opening words of Jürgen Moltmann's great study, The Crucified God, written 50 years ago this year. For Moltmann, the cross stands as a searing critique, not only of the lures and lies of this world, but as an absolute interrogation of the church itself, this church, any church, Here's what he says, the cross is the inner criterion of all theology and of every church which claims to be Christian. And this goes far beyond all political, ideological, and psychological criticism from the outside. Sisters and brothers, that is the test for us today. Moltmann says it, plainly, whether or not Christianity in an alien, divided, and oppressive society itself becomes alienated, divided, and an accomplice of oppression is ultimately decided only by whether the crucified Christ is a stranger to it or the Lord who determines the form of its existence. And which of those shall we be gathered here today? Only the crucified Christ can bring the freedom which changes the world because it is no longer afraid of death. Yes, and that is exactly why they had to crucify him. Because if we took the cross seriously, not the beautiful, bejeweled processional cross, not the ornamental crosses that decorate the place, but the rough-hewn wood and the blood-soaked nails, not the artistically rendered scenes, but the agony of the God so desperate to bring us back in love that he cries out in the despair of abandonment. If we preach that cross seriously, if we here, all of us, lived that love fully, then we would all in this place be in the business of liberating people from their fear, helping them to search for it where it truly lies, in their eternal souls, and not in a shopping bag. If we took that cross seriously, we would be shattering into pieces the fear that imprisons our neighbors and our world in meaninglessness. We would be freeing them from any need of trying to fill the void with luxury and vanity because we would be helping them to see that the deepest, truest, most enduring source of meaning was implanted in them by God's love from the start. And that is exactly why the wealthiest powers in this world, aided and abetted by the power of the state, is so desperate to make sure 
the word of the cross never gets out beyond the doors of this place. Because if it did, if it reached them, they would have no reason to stand in line anymore. They would truly be free. We would rather not deal with the cross for most of the rest of the church year. We would rather set our focus elsewhere on the stories, on the teachings, on the healings. We'd rather hear about the sheep or the seeds or the fatted calf or the net full of fish. We'd rather be reminded about the bumbling disciples or the stubborn crowd, but none of it, none of it adds up to anything without the cross. Because it is only through the cross that the absolute determination of God to love us into the full possibility of our lives is both revealed and enacted. It is only through the cross that we are liberated from fear and given the power to liberate others too. Only the crucified Christ can bring the freedom which changes the world because it is no longer afraid of death. At least two times each week, there are two lines that form on the Avenue Jorsan. There's the one I mentioned, the one down at Louis Vuitton. And there is the one here at the cathedral. One is a line of people who think they can buy meaning. And the other is a line of people who know they can't buy food. One is a line of people who think they can have everything. And the other is a line of people who have been told and believe they have nothing. And what we know, because of what we gather around today, because of the cross that stands in our midst today, what we know is that they are both wrong. So let us pray. O Christ, the master carpenter, who at the last through wood and nails purchased our whole salvation, wield well your tools in the workshop of this world, that we who come rough-hewn to your bench may be turned to a finer glory at your hand. Amen.